أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته may Allah reward you all for attending today for coming out and braving this fine Bradford weather that we've got and as well I'd like to thank the brothers for inviting the three of us up here to inshallah give you guys some perspective on some of our experiences and what happened to us, the reasons why we became Muslim, but most importantly that, inshallah, I pray that there's some benefit that's taken from this and that the brothers and sisters can reflect on what we have to say, inshallah. Now, to begin with my journey to Islam, I actually want to start with the end of my journey to Islam, which is when I took the Shahada. And I want to take you back almost four years to the 24th of April 2009. That was a Friday, that was the night I took my Shahada. The feeling of, of becoming Muslim, from coming out of Kufr and into Islam, is not something that, as I'm sure the brothers on stage would agree, is, is not something you can describe. That already when you take your Shahada, you've had a shower already, you're clean, you're pure, your clothes are completely clean. But that's nothing compared to when you actually say those words, and the entire weight of the world is lifted from your shoulders, never to come back again. Now, when that happened, I'd never felt anything like that, and I literally couldn't believe how I felt, that I felt as though I'd never been a non-Muslim. And I still have that feeling today, I, I can't actually remember how it felt to be a non-Muslim, I feel like I've been Muslim my entire life. Now, when I got home from taking the Shahada, and this was a mistake on my part, and I maintain it to this day, it was my fault, but I hadn't actually discussed with my parents or my older brother about the fact that I was considering Islam or that I wanted to become a Muslim. So to them, when I came home, I said, I've got, a, I've got some news for you, I've got a bit of a surprise for you. And subhanAllah, what a surprise it was that I told them I'd become Muslim. And their initial response was, okay, it's a bit strange. I was an atheist before this. We'll get to that, inshallah. They said, okay, that, that's, that's a bit strange. But they said, if that's your decision, then that's your decision. So I thought, okay, well, that's good. I've told them now. And that was the end of that. I went to sleep. And I woke up the next morning and went to work. And I was at work all day. A lot of Muslims who worked there, mashallah, they all came up, congratulated me. They heard the news. And then when I got back from work, I came back to my house and all the lights were switched off and I thought that's strange because I know everybody's in, the cars are outside. So I, I went in, hello, is anybody there, nobody there, I went upstairs and what I found was the three of them sat there in the dark and they said, right, we want to talk to you. And I thought, right, okay, I know what's coming. And so there it was, who have you been talking to, give us names, who are these people, why have you done this, you've betrayed us, and it went on and on, it got worse and worse and worse to the point where they were saying, you're not one of us, you've betrayed us. My mum even said, I wish you'd come home and told me you were gay, rather than you've come home and told me you're Muslim. And it got so bad that I thought, well look, she said basically get out, get out of the house. Emotional, you know. I, at the time, my response was, look, okay, I'm just gonna have to do what they say. So I started packing my bags in my bedroom, I started putting everything in, and um, as I'm doing this, the door was locked, and I could hear my mum screaming and crying and banging on the door outside. And that was when it hit me that, remember, I haven't even been a Muslim for 24 hours at this point. This is when it hits me that, okay, have I made a mistake? My mum is literally screaming and my family are in tears. Maybe I've done the wrong thing here. All those guys I've been talking to about Islam and stuff, it's not too late for me to just walk away. I can just turn around and say, I made a mistake, look, forget it. So as I'm packing my bags, I start to think, that, okay, I need to be sure that this is definitely right. And so in my head, then, I retraced my journey to Islam. Now, really it goes back to my childhood that we were brought up uh, in a Christian family. We were Methodist Christians. And um, for us, religion was two hours in Sunday school, and that was it. And the only reason we were required to go to Sunday school is because my parents wanted me to go to Church of England school, and you had to have like 300 hours worth of time in Sunday school in order to get into this, this Church of England school. So we did that, and that was it. I never went into a church again once I got into this school, which kind of shows how important religion was in our family. It was just something you said. It didn't actually have any impact on the way that we lived our lives, or what we thought about the world, or our place in it, or even where we took right and wrong from. It was, we just decided it ourselves, essentially. What, what God and what Jesus had to say and what the Bible had to say, that was just Sunday school. Forget it, it's not important outside of that. That was the attitude we had. 
Now, as I mentioned, I got into this school, so I, I'm a teenager now, growing up. And as I look around me and I start to see we have to sing hymns every morning, there was communion every few weeks, and I started to question it and think, why is it that people are doing this? What is the reason that they feel compelled to go and do this? Do they even know? So I started to ask people, do you, do you know that God exists? Do you, can you prove that Jesus was the Son of God? What about the Bible? Do you know that it's right? And the response I got every time was either detention or you can't, you can't ask these questions. You just have to believe in it. God says it, you just have to believe in it. And I thought, well, wait, wait, wait. If you've got no proof for it, if you don't know that this is true, then why are you, why are you following it? Why are you, I thought, wasting your time on these things? So age 11, I became an atheist. I thought, these, these people, they don't know what they're talking about. And I thought I was so smart because I'd figured it out and they were still ignorant. So then I used to, I spent the, the rest of my teenage years and my college years and early uni telling people that they were wrong, that God doesn't exist, there's nothing out there, there's no such thing as right or wrong, you do what you want. Because if God's not there, there's no heaven or hell, there's no criteria for what's right or what's wrong, and that was the way I lived my life. And I'll tell you, brothers, if you grow up as a teenager with no definition of right or wrong, you do whatever you want. You do whatever you want, because who's there to account you? Somebody, my mum or dad, they'd say something to me, who are you? There's no such thing as right or wrong. How can you tell me that I'm wrong? And this was the attitude, subhanAllah, that I grew up with. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that when I became Muslim, there was an issue with that. Yet, when I had that, that viewpoint on the world prior, there was no issue, there was no problem. They knew I was an atheist before. So when I graduate from university, this is when it really hits me now. I've grown up this whole time thinking that, look, I can do whatever I want. There is no right, there is no wrong. And then all of a sudden, I'm out of education and I'm into the big wide world around me. And I stopped and reflected at that point and I thought, look, is this all there is to life? That I'm just maximizing my time trying to enjoy myself, but really inside you don't feel content when you do that. Because imagine traveling without a map. All you'll do is just wander to different places, you'll just check different things out, try different things, but you're never really going anywhere. You never really achieve anything. And this was the feeling I had that, okay, yeah, whether it's drinks, drugs, girls, partying, whatever, even university, academically, whatever, you've done that, move on. But you start to run out of things to do, and you start to question it. And when I left university, this is when I questioned it. That is that all there is to life now? I go out, I get a job, nine to five it for 50 years and then I die? Maybe have kids, is that it? That's all I've got to look forward to, because if that's all there is, then I'm not that interested, to be honest. That was what I thought, I'm not that interested. If that's all life amounts to, if that's all everyone who's ever left university, who's ever grown up, if that's all they've ever done, then what am I going to add to that? I'm not going to add anything new to it. What's the point? So I got my, this now is summer 2008 when I graduate from university and I'm thinking then, okay, I need to be absolutely certain that what I believe is actually true. So I started to look into different things, different views on life, which, you know, was Christianity. I had another look at Christianity. I had a look at a few other things, Buddhism and things like that. And never occurred to me to look at Islam. Never, never once, never thought. I just saw Muslims and I thought, okay, yeah, Muslims. I, I, the, the thought that I would ever be a Muslim was ridiculous, to be honest. It, it could never have happened, subhanAllah. And so what had happened was, some of the brothers in the audience might get jealous when I say this, but when I went to university, the fees were only £1,200 a year. So I paid for it myself. I got a weekend job and I was able to pay for it myself. Alhamdulillah, no debt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected me even before I became Muslim. If I had done, I would have taken the shahada and been thousands of pounds in debt. But that wasn't the case. So I managed to pay for university myself. That weekend job, there were a lot of Muslims who worked in that place. In total, who worked there, there were about 1,000 people, and 75% easily was Muslim. So a minimum 750 people who worked there were Muslims. And during my time there, I'd made a lot of friends, and you know, we'd had discussions and debates, and like I say, I thought I was so smart. <coughs> and brothers, there were brothers there who used to come to work reeking of utter. I didn't even know what utter was at the time. I used to think, that guy's wearing perfume. What the? And there were, there were people who came, they'd come fully dressed in the thobe, they had big beards. In that whole time I was there, Guess how many people actually spoke to me about Islam? One. Of 750 minimum, one spoke to me about Islam. And all that happened was, he saw me one day, whilst I was going through this, this process of reflecting on things, he saw me in a bit of a state, and he said, he said, are you okay, you look a bit down. And I just said to him, just casually, I just said, look, I've been thinking recently, is there more to life than, than what I used to believe? And his eyes lit up when I said this. 
And he said, do you mean, does God exist? And I didn't mean, does God exist? But he said, do you mean, and I thought, well, I said to him, well, not really, but I'm willing to discuss it. And he said, okay, he said, let's sit down. So we went, we sat down in one of the little break rooms and he said to me, he said, look, and I'll never forget this. He said, look, if, if we start discussing this, before we do that, I need you to buy in on something. And he said, if I prove to you that God exists, what does that mean? And I said, I thought, this guy's never going to prove that God exists. So, I, so he said, if I prove, what does it mean? I said, okay, if you can prove it, that means I have a creator. That means right and wrong exist. Heaven and hell exist. That means I'm accountable for my actions and that I have a purpose. And he said, okay. He said, if you prove to me that God doesn't exist, I'll stop being a Muslim. I thought, all right, okay. Great. So he, he said, we won't discuss in work. He said, we'll meet outside of work and we'll, we'll chat about it there. So we did that Friday. We met up. We exchanged numbers, met up outside of work, this little restaurant. And he brought two other brothers along. And we started chatting about basically where did I come from? Why am I here? And he said, this was the question that was put to me, where do you think you came from? I thought, easy. I came from my mum and my dad. He said, okay, where did they come from? My grandma and my granddad, where did they come from? Okay, we came from the monkeys. This is what I was thinking at the time. We came from monkeys, evolution, so on and so forth. Now I thought, okay, I'll just throw them with the evolution argument. They didn't even entertain the evolution discussion. They said, okay, let's assume for argument's sake that even if there was such a thing as evolution, what starts that? The Big Bang starts that. Okay, what starts that? Now, the subject of, of where everything came from, what started the universe and creation, they don't really have an answer for that. They, for years and years and years they said it was the Big Bang that started it. But even now, today, scientists are, are saying themselves, admitting that, look, an explosion, a bang, is a reaction to something else. It's a reaction. So something has to have come before. Therefore, that wasn't the start. There was something prior to that. So I went away and I started looking into this. And the principal explanation they use, that they have various ones, and they try to use science to answer it, is that, look, matter collides with antimatter, and you have an explosion, and that's the Big Bang. And because matter is one and antimatter is zero, the universe came from nothing, because one times zero is nothing. I, now, I saw that, and I thought, right, look, that's a very clever bit of science. That's really clever, whoever thought of that. But then what struck me is that, look, brothers, if we were to go outside now, we'd be crazy to do it, because it's snowing, but if we were to go outside now and say, right, let's have a game of football, would we sit around and say, right, look, the ball goes into the net once, that's one goal. It goes into the net twice, that's two goals. If you tackle him and break his leg, that's a, that's a foul, it's a red card. Offside, none of us really know what that is, but offside, with ex you know, would we start going through the rules and explaining them? One? No, we wouldn't. Why? Because we already know them. We already know the rules to football. Now, if matter collides with antimatter and then there's a big bang and that creates the universe, what that means is that the rules of the universe were in place before the universe existed, which is impossible. Who wrote the rules? They have to have been decided by something else. So, on that premise, you understand that, look, this can't have been the beginning. There has to be something prior to that. And you can keep going and going and going that, look, whatever created this thing, created by this thing, created by this, 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 and you just go on and on and on until you come to a realization that, look, whatever came at the beginning, whatever started it all, by definition, can't have been created by something else. Because if it was, then it wasn't the start. So, the premise that you take that argument on then is that, look, if this thing that came at the beginning wasn't created by anything else, there are only two explanations. Number one, it created itself, which is ridiculous. You can't decide to create yourself if you don't exist. And just like if you're asleep, you can't decide, right, I'm going to wake up now. It's not possible. You're not in control. So you can't create yourself, which means there's only one possible explanation. This thing was there all along. It didn't have another creator. It didn't create itself. It has, the only explanation is that it was always there. No beginning, no end. So when you realize this, you think, okay, it was there all along. You, there's a few things you can work out about that. If it's there all along, that means it never got old. It doesn't get hungry. It has no weakness or flaw. Remember, I'm not calling it God at this point. I'm just saying there's something. There's a something out there. It doesn't have any weaknesses. It doesn't get old. If the universe is based on rules, this thing came first, which means it obeyed no other rule. It decided to create everything else. It has a will of its own. Intelligence. Not only that, but if it's, if it's there all along, then it's infinite. It has no bounds. There can't be more than one of it. Because if you, if you say that there's two infinite things, then they can only be as big as each other. There's a limit on that. 
So there can only possibly be one. So now, okay, one, it's flawless, it's infinite, it's got a will of its own, it created everything. Kind of sounds like God now. But I'm still not saying that at this point. So I went back to those brothers who I'd been discussing with, and I said, look, this is where I'm at. And they said, okay, now let's talk about Quran. Now when he said that word, I thought, whoa, I thought, okay, this guy, he wants to convert me now, he wants to make me into a Muslim. It had never crossed my mind before, we were just having a chat about the origins of, of universe and so on and so forth. And now it hits me that this guy wants to make me a Muslim. So I kind of backed off and I thought, look, you know, it, it was nice to chat, but that's the end of that. And then I thought to myself that, look, I embarked on this whole journey trying to find the truth. And now I've found something that, you know, I'm just going to deny because it doesn't feel right. I have to check this out, I have to see what they've got to say. So we started to discuss the Qur'an. Now, I didn't know much about it at the time, um, other than the basics. It was the holy text of Islam and so on and so forth. And looking at, into the Qur'an, I find that it's not a book. It's a series of verses. A series of verses that were revealed in Arabic that were spoken from the mouth of a man, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who couldn't even read. He was unlettered. And the things that this book discusses, the language that it uses, is so powerful and so eloquent, and yet so precise and straight to the point. And what is the Qur'an essentially? That it's not, it's not just a series of stories, the Qur'an is what? It's a book of law. Have you ever taken a book of law, of British law, off the shelf and start reading it? It's not like the Qur'an, even in English. It's, it's you know, official paragraph 1.2.3. The plaintiff says da 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 da. It's like that. It's really official language. Do not go through a red light until it turns green and say da 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 da. But the Quran, the book of law, isn't like this. The language within it is so powerful. And this book is revealed at a time when the Arabic language itself was pretty much at its apex. There were, as we know, there were poets in, in Mecca and Medina at the time who could speak the most eloquent Arabic, tell the most fantastic stories. And one of the signs that the Quraysh used to try and show that they were number one was that they had the best poets. And they actually used to send them to challenge Muhammad wasallam. And the Quran issued to these men a challenge because as we know, a lot of people tried to refute the Quran. It said, look, it, the challenge was shortened and shortened and was short on time, so I'll give the essential version. But the Quran said, look, if you disbelieve, if you do, it's in Surah Baqarah, if you don't think this book is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then all you have to do is create a surah like what's in this book. Just one chapter like what you see in this book. Because if somebody else can do it, that means it came from a man. If no one else can do it, that means it must have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I thought, okay, that's interesting. I wonder if anybody managed it. I look into it. Of course, nobody did. There were many challengers who attempted it, but nobody did. That was back then. How about more recently? And so if any of the brothers are familiar with Orientalism and, and some of the movements that took place when the British Empire and some of the colonial powers went into the Muslim world, what they tried to do was to cut the Muslims' relationship with the Qur'an. And the way they tried to do this was to meet this challenge, to disprove the Qur'an. So there are entire institutes that were set up to refute the language of the Qur'an and imitate it. None of them could do it. There were professors who were paid hundreds of thousands of pounds. They became Muslim because they couldn't do it. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, that's interesting. That on the one hand, there's this infinite, flawless thing with a will of its own. And on the other hand, we've got this book, which is so powerful. Even in English, it's unlike anything you've ever read. That virtually solves any problem you can come across. And no one has been able to disprove that this is from God. I have these two things that I cannot deny. But I, I didn't take my shahada. Because to me, it, it still felt alien. It felt unnatural. And I kind of backed off from the guys who I'd been chatting to. And then what happened, I backed off for about a month or so. And what happened then was that it was one uh, lunchtime at work and I sat down to have my dinner and a Muslim guy sits next to me and a non-Muslim guy sits across the desk. And subhanAllah, I don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed him to start talking or what happened there, but he starts saying, oh, you to the Muslim guy, oh, you Muslims, you know, you're so dense, why do you believe in God? There's nothing out there, it's stupid. And I thought, right, I'll stay quiet. And this is where the Muslim guy now, he'll start telling him that, look, there's an infinite origin that what came at the beginning of everything it's flawless it's one and there's the quran which is uh, you know it has a linguistic challenge to mankind nobody's matched it i thought he's going to destroy this guy the muslim says yeah but bro haven't, haven't you seen trees like clearly trees mean that there's god <laughs> this was his argument and then and then he says to the guy he says look it says a law in your hand this guy doesn't know a letter of arabic he's never seen arabic in his entire life he says look it says Allah in your hand even i didn't know what he meant at the time 
And I thought, oh no, the non-Muslim guy, he started laughing. Understandably, he started laughing at this. And he said, that's why you're a Muslim. So I thought, look, this guy is getting murdered. I have to do something. So I started to talk. And I went through the whole discussion that, you know, there has to have been an infinite creator, that the Quran has never been, has never been beaten. And basically, as a non-Muslim, I proved Islam to another non-Muslim. The Muslim guy, bless him, didn't know what was going on. He was looking at us both like this. But, and so I, I basically go through the whole discussion. And at the end of it, the non-Muslim guy, he sat there and he, got, he thinks about it for a minute. And he goes, yeah, that's pretty interesting, but I don't really care. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. So, you know, do one, basically. And he stood up and he walked away. And I sat there for a minute. The, the, the Muslim guy, he just kind of left. I don't think he knew what to say. And I sat there on my own for a minute, thinking about it. And I thought, man, this guy's an idiot. I've just proven to him beyond the shadow of a doubt that this has to be true and he hasn't accepted it. And then it hits me that this is me. I know it's true. Why haven't I accepted it? So I went and I found the brother and I said, look, I think I'm ready. And the Friday after that was when I took my Shahada, alhamdulillah, which was almost four years ago. Now, just to bring it full circle, the, the challenges then that I faced with my family when they threw me out and so on and so forth, that I went through it all in my head and I thought, no, this has to be true. It has to be correct. I didn't have a shadow of a doubt. Therefore, if this is true and I know it's true, then any challenge I'm ever faced with, it, it becomes irrelevant. Because I know that Islam is the truth and I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has essentially got my back. And so, I left that night and then I came back, moved back in with my parents. And slowly but surely the relationship improved to the point, brothers, where it's now better than it ever was with my parents. That they see how much more reliable, how much more trustworthy I am. To the point that I recently brought my arm, I've still got the sling here, brothers, I, take, I took it off to do the talk. That I brought my arm about six weeks ago. My mum, bless her, has taken me every single Friday to and from the masjid for Jummah. The same mother who, they haven't embraced Islam yet, inshallah, if brothers and sisters can make dua, that's all I ask. But look how that's changed. Because I knew confidently that Islam has to be true.